Want to crush that exam or test you have coming up and get the best grades possible without pulling all-nighters? In today's video in my evidence-based learning series, I'm going to give you a practical plan and strategy that I used in medical school and when training as a surgeon to nail your exam preparation and study efficiently and effectively. Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name's Alex. I'm a surgeon and founder of a few edtech companies. And on this channel, we focus on learning and human performance to help you live healthier, wealthier, happier, and more productive lives. Now, I sat a ton of exams during my time in medical school. And then when I graduated, I sat exams as part of my surgical training and for my master's in surgical sciences and degree in education. In fact, I did at least one big exam each year up to the age of 26. And over the years, I developed a pretty good system for preparing and studying for exams that helped me to rank top for medicine and surgery, despite there being loads to learn. Today, I'm gonna to share the system that I use to study for any exam or test and go into practical detail with ways that you can implement it yourself, regardless of what you're studying for. Now, this video focuses on practicalities, and if you haven't yet watched the earlier videos in this evidence-based learning series, I'd highly recommend starting with my video on the science behind active recall which dives into research to help you understand how to learn. This is the first part in a focused look in this learning series at studying for exams. And in the next video, I'll cover part two, which is how I avoid burnout and can study for over 80 hours a week. So make sure you hit subscribe. I'm gonna break this video down into planning your study schedule and then look at how I study using some of the evidence-based methods covered in other videos in this series, like Active Recall. And I'll give you some note-taking tips and memory hacks at the end to help you not just pass the exam, but to rank first, so be sure to stick around. So the first part of this video is going to focus on preparation. Now, while this might seem obvious, the way in which we prepare for exams or tests is critical to success. Regardless of what you're studying, you'll likely know well in advance of when a test or exam is taking place. When I sat medical school exams, they were usually at the end of an eight week block of lectures or clinical placements with larger end of year exams held in the summer. While precise timings will change, I usually gave myself around four to six months to prepare for larger exams in terms of focused study time, depending on the volume of information I needed to learn. Understanding when the exam is and how long others spend preparing is step one. This will give you realistic expectations of what's required in terms of study time and gives you time to plan your own study schedule. Most subjects that you need to study for will have a curriculum outlining the scope of what's going to be tested. And similar to the date of the exam, you should understand the format of the exam itself. When I sat medical and surgical exams, written exams were usually multiple choice papers lasting several hours, and clinical exams then tested your actual skills in person. While it can seem boring reading and understanding the course curriculum and exam information provided by whoever setting the exam, it's critical for doing well at the exam itself. Usually the curriculum and topics tested will be listed online or in a course manual, and the exam format and timing will be outlined in detail together with dates and exam rules, such as whether you need to bring ID and where the exam will actually be held. I usually copied this information into my calendar or saved it to my Evernote so I could quickly find it to triple jack details as the exam got closer. One bad habit I got into early in medical school was to think that some elements of the curriculum weren't important and weren't going to be tested. So I simply didn't study for these. This was probably because I found them difficult or boring and I never did very well in these areas as I simply hadn't revised them, which then reinforced this mindset. As in my video on how to learn anything fast, be sure to attack your weaknesses and remember that anything that's on the curriculum can be tested and might come up at the exam. So just learn everything. While asking people and reading information about the exam or test is good, the best way to understand the types of questions, format and difficulty level is to get hold of some actual past papers or breakdowns of the exam or the test from previous years. For big exams like end of year exams, these usually exist as actual past papers or unofficial past papers where previous students have written down what questions they got. Some teachers will provide these as part of formal mocks. Some exam boards have them online, but when you get to postgraduate exams, you might have to do a little bit of detective work and ask your peers if they exist and if they can share them with you. I used to have a quick read through past papers before starting my exam preparation, so I had an idea about the difficulty level and would then save these for nearer the end of my revision period to test my knowledge against what was most similar to the real thing. Decide how you're going to study. There are usually some recommended resources for most exams, such as study books, lecture notes, or websites, which cover the curriculum and will help you to read around topics. For my medical finals, I used a longer reference book together with a shorter notes book 
and the course e-learning and lectures, which covered the entire curriculum. You'll also want to decide on what electronic tools you're going to use. I typically use Evernote and Notion for planning my study schedule and for taking notes, which then integrate with my calendar to book out days and weeks to focus on key areas of revision. As I'll look at more in the next section, I also always use online question banks and learning tools to actively test my knowledge and automate spaced repetition. Whatever you're going to use, ask others and research recommended tools and then focus on the ones that work for you rather than trying to use too many. Creating a study timetable may again seem stupidly simple, but it's amazing how many people do this important piece of preparation incorrectly. A proper study timetable is not just about breaking down the curriculum into the days or weeks you're going to study. A study timetable should help you to build good study habits and stay healthy during revision time so you can learn effectively. The best study timetables take into account what topics you're weakest at and puts these first, and factors in spaced repetition to help you remember things for longer. Spaced repetition assumes self-testing and using active recall to learn effectively. And as in my video on using spacing to study, I've included a link to a study timetable in the description below, which has a spacing schedule built in for planning when you're going to study and test yourself on topics to save you some time. When I planned out my study schedule, I'd break down each day and ensure I blocked out time for exercise, rewards, food, socializing and sleep. And I'll dive into this and why it's so important in my next video. So be sure to hit subscribe and keep watching after the end of this one. A good study schedule should plan around your life. When I had to study for surgical exams, working over 70 hours a week as a doctor and running a business, it was critical that I manage my time effectively. Just like in my video on how to learn anything fast, I'll routinely break down my study timetable into goals, based on mastery of topics as I work through what will be assessed at the exam. So how do you actually know that you know a topic or subject? I always found this tricky when I was starting off with exams and at medical school, I'd usually set time-based goals such as reading X number of hours of a textbook each day. Now, as we know from studies like Harpik et al in 2011, simply reading or highlighting is nowhere near as effective as testing yourself and retrieving information known as active recall or retrieval practice. For a deeper dive into how I used active recall to rank first at medical school and surgical exams, be sure to check out my video on the topic. So rather than setting goals and assigning time to simply reading chapters of books, set goals that are based on the number of questions you're completing, and preferably when you've got all the questions correct using spaced repetition and mastered them. I would usually work out how long it took me to do practice questions and then map time into my study timetable to complete a certain amount each day at a similar time to build habits and make learning into a game. I'd then allocate time to read around topics to ensure I understood facts and could apply concepts. I'll dive into how I do this in the next part of the video when we look at how I use Active Recall. My final tip when preparing is to form a study group of people who are also sitting the exam or test. This will help you to stay motivated and a good study group should hold you accountable on days when you just don't feel like studying. Study groups can also make learning more fun by asking each other questions, as we'll look at shortly, and by explaining topics to others, you'll develop a better understanding of the concept itself. You can also share ways to learn with your study group, like this video, so that you can all follow the same study timetable and use the same tools to learn. Okay, so now you're prepared, let's look at how you can practically use Active Recall and some of the concepts covered in this evidence-based learning series to crush any exam. I'm gonna assume that you've watched through this evidence-based learning series and have switched your mindset away from reading and highlighting to jumping in and testing yourself with a growth mindset. So let's look at the fastest and most efficient ways to do just that. The most time efficient way to get started using Active Recall is to use test questions which already exist. To be helpful, these questions should be set at the appropriate difficulty and test your application of knowledge as well as recollection of facts. As in my video on using game design for learning to help you get into a flow state, these should be challenging but not so difficult that you want to give up and questions should get progressively more difficult as your knowledge increases. So let's look at where you can get these existing questions from in practical terms. Past papers are best for application of knowledge and most realistic to the standard of questions which will appear in the final test or exam. As mentioned in the preparation section, these might exist already or you might need to do some detective work to get hold of them. The website for the exam board, mock exams scheduled by your teacher or course, or questions noted down by successful students from previous years are usually the best places to locate these. The main disadvantage of past papers is that they don't always have full explanations with them, so some reading around is needed, and like me, you might want to save these for nearer the end of your study period. Online question banks exist for most subjects and exams. The best ones employ students who've passed the exam to write down questions that they got and write out explanations when the knowledge is fresh in their brains. This near-to-peer question creation is really useful 
And most questions and answers are also fact-checked by experts. I should note, as I built a successful test prep company, which passively generated a few million in recurring revenue. When choosing a question bank, be sure to look at reviews and ask around for word of mouth reviews to see what's most like the real exam. Online learning systems like Shikan, which I've invested in, allow you to buy question sets for a range of exams and have lots of cool features, including automated spaced repetition, mindful learning to keep you relaxed, and multiplayer challenges so you can study with your friends. Things like Verti's interactive video system also challenges you for more practical tasks, such as learning for objective structured clinical exams. Student-generated questions also exist on platforms like Quizlet and Anki in the form of flashcards. Unlike past papers and online question banks, these may not be in the same question format as the exam itself, and they're unlikely to have been checked by experts, but they often provide a great way to quickly get through more questions. But again, make sure you check and use question sets that others have used to successfully pass the exam. When I studied for surgical exams, there were online question banks and past papers which came recommended by those who'd previously passed the exam. The recommendation was typically just do all the questions in the question bank and past papers and you'll do fine at the exam. To give you an idea about this, for a single two and a half hour written exam paper with around 100 single best answer questions, this meant roughly completing around 2,500 practice questions. To get the best score possible, I'd combine this with reading around topics, understanding concepts, and ensuring that I mastered all these questions and past papers by setting a daily and weekly question goal to hit. Now, not every test or exam will have existing questions you can jump right into, and not every explanation will help you to fully understand concepts. In fact, as we've previously learned in this evidence-based learning series, you can test yourself simply by trying to recall facts in your head. While practicing using existing questions is very efficient, I usually incorporate some of the following methods into my revision to help me come top in exams and tests. The closed book technique is the best way to test yourself and use active recall when reading through a textbook. As mentioned in the preparation section, I usually choose a structured textbook and a shorter notes book, which break down key concepts into sections, which I can then test myself on by closing the book. For subjects like medicine, where learning facts like the signs and symptoms of diseases is needed, I might cover the signs and symptoms section of a book and then test myself before revealing the answer. Drawing a spider diagram from a central concept ensures that you're actively linking concepts and represent them in a visual way. I would add a concept or topic at the center and then draw out the associated facts around it without looking at a book. I'd then go back over and analyze what I'd missed and map out the spider diagram in more detail to boost my learning. Study groups are another great example of these where your study buddies will test you from a book and ask questions in a social and supportive environment. Saying things out loud or explaining a topic to someone else helps you to test your own understanding and put the concept into your own words to make sure it's learned deeply. To help you come first in any exam, you're gonna need some extra learning hacks that use active recall and some other evidence-based learning techniques. So in this final section, I'm gonna jump into some study hacks to help you not only pass your exam, but to also get top grades and beat your peers. The first tip is to take notes from lectures, books, and notes correctly to be as efficient as possible with your learning. Like in my video on how to remember everything you read, I will usually skim to the end of a book chapter relevant to what I'm testing myself on, and then look at the end of chapter summaries and the key learning points. I'll skim through to find key diagrams, concepts, and how topics are organized. I'll read and note down into my note system in Evernote or Notion, or into a physical notes book. I'll then close the book and try to recall key facts or concepts. When I'm actually taking notes, I'll write down questions which the notes answer and color the answers in red. This means that when I come to test myself later, I can quickly run through my notes and I can also share these with others to give back to the student-generated questions outlined in part two of this video. Mnemonics help to aid retrieval practice, and the term comes from the Greek, meaning relating to memory. They work by associating the original information with a more accessible memory that's easier to remember. In medicine and surgery, I use mnemonics all the time for remembering long lists like causes of diseases, such as the acronym I get smashed for the causes of pancreatitis, which I can still remember today. Idiopathic, gall stains, ethanol, trauma, steroids, mumps and malignancy, autoimmune causes, scorpion or spice things like hyperlipidemia, hypercalcemia, hyperthyroidism, ELCP, and drugs. You can see how that transforms a long list of very different concepts into a single acronym and phrase that I can remember to this day. This is an example of an acronym-based mnemonic that forms a memorable phrase. Other types of mnemonics include rhymes or phrases like Richard of York gave battle in vain for remembering the colors of the rainbow. The method of Loki, no, not that Loki, is a form of visual mnemonic that maps things we're learning to locations or objects in our spatial memory. This is also known as memory palaces and is the system used by memory masters in memory competitions to recall long lists of information. When I study, 
I'll often practice redrawing diagrams, and as surgery is very visual, I'll link facts to anatomical areas and visualize what patients look like in terms of their signs and symptoms mapped to a location that I know or I'll imagine them presenting in a doctor's waiting room. If you're studying something non-medical, you might want to visualize facts as objects that relate to those facts and place them into a room that's familiar to you. I'll cover the method of Loki and memory palaces for learning in detail in another video, so be sure to hit subscribe and follow the links to the other videos in the evidence-based learning series at the end. I hope this video helps you to ace your exams, and if you have any other exam preparation and study tips, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. Thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you again in my next video, which will look at how I can study for over 80 hours a week using some of the methods covered in this video.